Hi, wrestling fans, and welcome to another edition. I'm John Arezzi. Welcome to your exclusive edition of Pro Wrestling Spotlight Rewind, where we bring you back to the early days of Inside Pro Wrestling Talk, covering the history of my groundbreaking radio show, which aired on commercial radio in the New York market from 1989 to 1995. Each week, this show reviews a different original broadcast from that era, giving you a look back at some of the breaking news stories, historic interviews, and memories from that era where talking about the inside of the wrestling business was just beginning to gain some traction in the industry. On this episode, we're going to review show number nine of the Pro Wrestling Spotlight, which originally aired on 1440 AM WNYG in Babylon, New York. This one aired on June the 4th, 1989. It was a special episode as we had the one and only appearance by the legendary Bobo Brazil, on this program, and also promoter Mario Savoldi. So we have another good one in store today for Marsh and I to review. Uh, But first, as we've discussed, uh, for now, uh, the review of these vintage shows can only be heard if you're a patron of Pro Wrestling Spotlight. And although we're still on all streaming platforms, those platforms will be to air full-length shows from my archives. Patrons will have the exclusive video access to this episode as well. And you can get involved for 5 bucks a month to get you the entire archives of the Pro Wrestling Spotlight, all the new episodes, and it has access to over 500 posts of audio content, 150 pieces of video content, uh, photo sets, historic 8-millimeter films, and much more. So go to patreon.com forward slash John Arezzi. Check it out. Check out all the tiers that are available. Or for more information, you can just reach out to me, John at mattmemories.com. Let's bring on our co-host, our producer, our creative director, the man who's been so busy doing so many things for so many interesting types of personalities. Let's bring Marsh on. Hey, you. Hey, yo, Marsh. You didn't say that last week, or did you? I don't think I did last week. Yeah, last you week was a up. whirlwind. <laughs> yeah, I fucked up the week before that too. God, you fucked up. You fucked up. I know. I went through one of the Kinda old like shows. Like Vince and, McMahon. Yeah. <laughs> that that was been. crazy. It was. That was we can get into but, it. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, it's been good. It's been pretty good. Getting stuff done. Getting trying to get ahead of the game. You know. Yes, yes. There's a lot going on, uh, knee deep in uh, the postseason. What the Mets are going to do? Are they in? Are they out? Are they going to get in? Do they have to go to Atlanta? Do they have to fly to San Diego? Were they in the middle of a hurricane? Did anyone drown? It's been the t- most tumultuous final week of a baseball season that I've ever seen. So uh, look forward to that. Uh, hopefully they're going to get in. If not, you just may not see me anymore because I will be so depressed. After the after they come and they they were the shits in the beginning, they turned it around. They've been playing great baseball, but now will they get in? So, um, so that's that. How far, and not, yes, how far will they? Can they get without winning that you'd still be happy with? Like, do you just want to see them in the playoffs? I well, mean, yeah. Do now just, that do you want to see them? Would, the, I mean, obviously, you want to see them win the whole thing. But like, where where uh, could absolutely. they stop? 
Well, I mean, once you're in, you want them to go all the way, so it would be a disappointment yeah. regardless. For them to be in the actual playoffs is because of the season, how exciting it was. I'm I'm really happy with where it turned out, but it would be a major disappointment if they don't get in. If they don't yeah. get in, then it's kind of like, wow, this sucks. If they yeah. do get in, they're gonna have a they're not gonna have an easy road. So because of they're not you know one of the top uh, finishing teams, so they're gonna be uh, the road team. Uh, for all the playoffs, including the World Series. So they're not going to have home field advantage any time during any of the playoffs uh, if they get in. Uh, so um, it's going to be it's going to be nerve wracking. It's going to be nerve wracking. It's going to drive me crazy. And my you know, my legs are shaking. My heart is palpitating. My blood pressure is elevated. Uh, and uh, I am uh, ready for this weekend. And I just don't want to see them have to fly back to Atlanta for a doubleheader. Uh, yeah. on Monday because that would be the shits and then have to fly all the way to San Diego if they have to face the Padres in the first round. So it's all yeah. bracketed out. It's, it's a very confusing and it's, uh, it, it, it's crazy. Um, yeah. And other than that, I just, I was on the road for a couple of days this week. I was in Philadelphia, you know, the city of brotherly love, not, mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, did some work there, which I can't really talk about yet, but, uh, uh, I was really happy with the with the trip, and uh, I'll be able to disclose that once uh, things are announced. So it's wrestling related too. Yeah, it's always cool for me when you go on work trips and stuff, especially when it's wrestling related, and especially if they um, are diving into you and 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 stuff. You know, I mean, not that you yeah, were like good. topic, but I'm saying like when they want you because of who you are in your archives. That's when I get really excited. You know. Yeah, this one is uh, probably more extensive than the other uh, involvement that I had with this project in years past. So uh, this will be a, this will be a, this will be probably the the most on camera stuff that I've ever done for this particular um, uh, outlet. So uh, let's uh, segue into another uh, piece of wrestling, uh, which is the Vince McMahon documentary. Mm -hmm. Have you seen it? I have. I have finished it. I watched it beginning to end. Thoughts? I don't think I'm breaking ground here to say that I think I expected more uh, okay. in a lot of ways. But I do think it was done really well. And I did find it still captivating, even though there was little, if any, actual new information that we didn't already have. Um. It was the way they put it all together was really cool. This feels like the kind of thing you could give someone to watch as a concise history of of Vince's relationship to WWE if someone doesn't know. But if you already know a lot, it's just a really cool package of how they're doing it. And some of these guys looked great. I give them a lot of flack. Dave Meltzer came across great in this series, I thought. Yeah, yeah I've seen half of it. So I'll watch the remaining half this weekend. Uh, in between Met games, and, and I mm-hmm. look forward to seeing it. I did think that Dave did a really great job in 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 telling the story, weaving it, and being like Dave had been when I knew him. You know, straight down the middle, pretty much. So I thought that yes. was really good, and and the fact that McMahon tried to buy this from Netflix, he didn't want it to come out. It's out, even though he participated in it. Once all the shit hit the fan with the lawsuits and Janelle's uh, uh, Janelle's lawsuit, and it it's really interesting. It was shot really well. There was great. Um, it was really cool to see uh, uh, my mother's face <laughs> during the Donahue uh, clip because my mother was right there, front and center, for about three to five seconds. You see the dark haired woman. Uh, that's my mama. Uh, and uh, and I had about three seconds on air with me, a big 350 plus pound dude sitting next to Meltzer. Staring so. the way you were just dead eyeing right at Vince. <laughs> well, he, was was me, if, he, he was giving me the worst looks. The worst. If looks could kill, I'd be a dead man back then. He just he, he laser looked at me, man. Is that why you wore the sunglasses so he wouldn't see you cry? Yeah, with those sunglasses. I wish I never wore them. I look like an idiot. I look like a carny. It's Not tough, the best man. People are always trying to look the part, right? And what does that part look like? And I mean, I even saw. But something I wore those dark glasses all the time. I wore them like I wore them 
constant. Yeah, you know, there were prescription glasses. They weren't just sunglasses. But I kept them on my head, and that's the way I walked around the world with those fucking glasses on, <laughs> like an idiot. <laughs> Well, Not no, because you were trying to look the part. You're a businessman, promoter, wheeler, dealer, entrepreneur, salesman. You were, you know, what does that look like in, in movies and TV shows? And um, what was the one with, uh, with uh, I'm thinking of Tom Cruise. I mean, he's wearing glasses, sunglasses the whole time. It was part of the, the deal. You know, you were dressing like the part you wanted, right? Yeah, or hiding something. Yeah. Not wanting people Just, to look at you in the yeah. eye. Your eyes were red a lot back then, were they not? They're always red. <laughs> That's why I'm so calm. So, it could have been defense, huh? Yeah. I wasn't calm in Philly, though. When I got checked mm-hmm. into the hotel they put me in. Yeah. I felt like I was back in Philly in 1990. I felt like I was in a jail cell without my cellmates. Yeah. One bed, one night table tiny little lamp a tv and a remote and that's basically it no closet ceiling was looked like stone it was like concrete concrete walls and i was not i couldn't sleep i wasn't happy and outside my window i looked right into a parking garage <laughs> it was a boutique hotel yeah you know, they're like, you can't get this experience at home. Think of all the luxury you would have. Yeah. I checked in. I couldn't <laughs> even get a, couldn't even get a, a, I couldn't even get a snack or soda. I got in late and uh, there was nothing open except for if I walked outside, there was a uh, psychic uh, open next door and there was homeless people sleeping on the street. Yeah. What did the psychic tell you? I didn't go. Oh, come on, John. <laughs> it was like, you're going to be unhappy for the next 48 hours sleeping here. Yeah. <laughs> As you walk in, the little bell chimes, she turns around. She's like, no, no, get out. Neither no, one of us they, wants this. <laughs> you know, they took care of the airfare. They had limo service for me from my uh, place to the airport. Picked me up at the airport and back. And so they treated me really well. And it was really good to uh, to participate in this. More details yeah. to come. But the McMahon yeah. thing, I can't wait to see the rest of it. And, uh, you know, we're in the business or we're in the business or, you know, have been in and out of the business. So we know all this stuff. But for the layman out there, for the people who may have not known too much about McMahon, uh, this was pretty eye opening. I think it could have been in a lot of ways. And and to me, I think a lot of the, the real nuggets in there are the... Um, Little, there's little blurbs of Vince who says a couple things here and there where you realize that he's saying more than he's saying. Yeah. And those moments are when you kind of go like, oh, like he does give some insight into his mind. And he does give some insight into how he approaches things from a business perspective. And he does give a little bit of insight about how he feels in every sense of the, the way that that he's never opened up a side of him to mm-hmm. people. And so uh, I think it was really cool and fascinating. And I'm, and I mean, I'm glad it's out there. I'm glad they did put it out there. Um, I think it's, I think by the end of it though, you realize why he didn't want it out there. Uh, and I, I don't think why. it's because, and it's not because it, it delves in past something, right? There's no new information in there. He's not trying to stop it because this information is otherwise unavailable. It's all there. I mean, that whole well, lawsuit, which you know, Grant, is public. Yeah, he, he stopped participating once all that stuff broke. And that's when he stopped participating in the dock. Yeah. He had and that bigger fish it. to fry. <laughs> you know, I saw a clip on social media today. I think it was on X. It was that little part with Shane, how McMahon was telling him he's got to stab him with the with the dagger or something if he wanted yeah, to. It was like, yeah. Yeah, that mean, you know, how do you tell your son something like that? We don't have and then kids, he, John. And, and then Paul and Paul E was like saying how you know he said he would finish. He'd have to finish Vince off the same way he, Vince would have finished his own father off if he. <laughs> I'm like, what are we looking at here, folks? This is getting pretty 
pretty dark. <laughs> well, because Stab the me best part now, about that. right there. You want this company? Is, <laughs> to oversimplify the conversation, Vince tells his son, hands him a knife that's sharp enough to yeah. do it and says, stab me in the heart and kill me to take over yeah. the business because I would have murdered your grandfather if he ever got in my way. And you're like, what? <laughs> this is... And so then they're like, so, so Shane left the company. And you're like, yeah. I yeah, I wonder why. <laughs> Tony Khan? <laughs> yeah. Shane's all like, I wanted to explore other business opportunities at the time. You're like, I'm sure there was a lot of other opportunities you were trying to take yeah. advantage of at the time. It didn't involve, you know, your father handing a knife over to you and telling him to plunge it into your chest. The And the response of, because I would have done it to your... to. My dad is insane. (laughs) That's the super insane part. Not just do it, but it's also because I would have. Like, that's when it got crazy. All right. Imagine Shane going home that night and telling those kids, Grandpa's dead. (laughs) (laughs) Good news and bad news. I'm running the company. I'm I'm the boss now, kids. (laughs) Um, Wow. I'll be be anxious to talk to you about it when you finish it, though, because I do feel like that there was... um, I feel like there was a few things that were unfair to certain people, not even Vince. I don't even think they were being unfair to Vince. But I feel like they were unfair to some of the, the talking heads because of how they wanted to present what people were saying and feeling and juxtapose, juxtapose it with um, something that might make them look foolish and thinking that or feeling that way. And I think that's a little unfair, but um, yeah, but yeah, it is fascinating. It's great. And so uh, I'm surprised more people weren't involved. A uh, friend of the show, Medusa, had said on her podcast that they asked her to do it, and she just didn't get a good feeling about it, so she didn't. Um, yeah. I wonder how many people, because I know Jim Ross has said that they didn't ask him at all, and he thought they would have. You know. Uh, yeah, I thought I thought I would actually get approached now that I saw it because of how deep Mushnick was involved in it. Like, um, you know, I'm kind of I was kind of instrumental in, in in giving Mushnick the awareness of you know, getting him involved in it. So I was kind of yeah. surprised, uh, but you know, I'm not sorry. Um, but I was, uh, I was a little surprised about it because, you know, all those clippings, you know, you could see my name in the, in, in the articles that much Nick was writing. And of course, uh, much Nick to this day, I mean, no love lost there. Do you think you can get Phil on the show? I, uh, well, imagine. <laughs> I mean, if he seems like he's hip to talk about Vince, let's bring him back through, dude. Hey, he comes on the phone at one point. He calls in. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. I used to talk to him all the time. I know, so I'm saying. I, I like, always hey. thought about reaching out to him and seeing if he would do it. I don't think he would, but the fact that this doc is out now, and now that he uh, he's still very articulate, and I read his column today actually in the in the New York Post. It wasn't McMahon related, but I still love reading. Phil much Nick. That's great. He's polarizing. I've always thought he was pretty interesting. Yeah. He was unrelenting. I, even, I mean, I guess not that it matters, but I don't even know where I really lie on some of these guys. Like what I think, I don't know if I hold like much of an opinion on Phil much Nick one way or the other. I find him fascinating. And I think that he does important work. So whatever that means, you know? Yeah. He was unrelenting and he's still, once a month or so, he'll write a little blurb about them in his columns. Yeah. N- never, never nice. <laughs> He's he, he writing wrestling. all sorts of columns, and at the end, it's like, P.S. Fuck Vince. <laughs> yeah, P.S. <laughs> He's still a dick. <laughs> <laughs> still hate that guy. Still hate him. Yeah. Well, let's um, go I'll travel back in time 35 years. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. This was an interesting one. It was a fun one. Uh, you put in some stuff early on. Bobo Brazil was coming on. Can you? First off, was it the first time you talked to Bobo? It was the first time I talked to Bobo. Yeah, I was always a fan of his. I mean, when I first started watching wrestling in '65, '64, '65, he was like, he was the dude, man. He was, you know, the cocoa butt, the, you know, he was just opposing big figure, historic. And then, of course, reading about him with his uh, historic feud with the Sheik. Um, mm-hmm. And he was just, uh, he was a mainstay. 
and he was just an amazing uh, personality that was kind of beloved in the business. And um, being able to get him on was uh, was a real treat for me. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I wanted to understand a little bit, uh, and I know that typically your fan base is for fan so they probably know more than me at this point. But I feel like Boba Brazil is a name I hear about a lot, but I don't really understand. I don't think I grasp how big he was because when you got him on here, you are putting were so heavy that there was a second I was like, is John being sarcastic? And then I realized you definitely weren't <laughs> being sarcastic, but you were really wow. laying it on thick about how wonderful it was to have him and, and how everyone has to know who he is and, you know, yeah. no introduction needed kind of concept. So I just want, if you could give me a brief little insight, how big was he? I would have to say he was six, five, six, six. I mean, massive guy, At, but he was, he was not a flabby. He was he was just big, huge hands, um, and he was uh, imposing with that voice. He had that you know baritone voice, and uh, he was uh, uh, he had you know he had good moves in the ring. Um, he had a really good like a haymaker type of punch, and of course the headbutt, uh, which he coco butt. And he made he kind of made famous in the wrestling business. He used to actually take somebody up, take them by the hair, and almost like jump up and and land on them. Uh, but his battles with the Sheik, I mean, they're up on YouTube. I mean, those were historic battles when they were exchanging that United States Heavyweight Championship. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, can't say enough about him. Big, huge thighs, legs, uh, and just charismatic. When it, very popular. Very popular with the fans. Not in the run that he had when the last time he worked in, at least in the, he was much older in the WWWF was uh, 76, 75, 76. He came in to do not full time work, but he'd appear on TV and he wasn't even really at the garden. Like, but he would, he would wrestle in Philadelphia or do a Hamburg TV taping and do a few house shows now and then. Um, but he was uh, back in the day in the '60s. Uh, he was at the Garden a lot. He was an upper echelon babyface. Yeah. Was he? How was he a main eventer guy or like a just under the main event? Um. Well, Bruno was always main event back in the day, but he would be like second, second, like semi main event guy. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool, man. That's awesome. Yeah, this was this was a cool interview. It was it was nice and long. You had him on through like two breaks, I think. Um, part of that, I believe, you had a lot more ads on this show than normal, because there was a few times you went, "I have to go to another ad break," and I'm like, "Yes," and I'm like, "Okay," and you did. So, I don't know if that if there's a reason behind it. You did describe the hats having 3D, <laughs> 3D action figure patching is how you tried to how. You- and also, like hot glue and action figures to the hat. We know you know, that I, I when I used to when I used to wear those hats, and I only wore them when I got stoned, because I could swear that the wrestlers would be actually grappling on the bill of the hat after I've had a nice doobie. You wore one? Yeah, privately. <laughs> How many did you own? When I was home, like. And then I'd smoke a doobie and I'd go look in front of the mirror and I could see them dancing around up there and yeah, running around the hat or drop kicks. And yeah, it was kind of cool. Was it that? I actually heard from <laughs> the LJNs. No, they way too heavy, right? Oh, they yeah, weren't LJNs, no. And they weren't even Hasbro's. They were almost like those micro mini yeah. figurines that they had, action figures back then. It didn't last long. Rich Williams, um, who's one of our best patrons uh, he, he actually <laughs> sent me a little message on our patreon uh ne- acknowledging that he'd never seen one of those before i don't think very do you have a picture did. of it somewhere no i should have okay. how many hats of them did you get and who did you have on your hat it was custom <laughs> you got to do whatever you wanted <laughs> i don't remember <laughs> all right i wish i was like maybe bobo <laughs> <laughs> Probably Bubba, Bubba and Bruno, handmade figures. Yeah. By as a matter of fact, uh, I wish I had. I, 
Okay. Wouldn't that be amazing if there's a picture of you in studio with a fucking hat on that has figures glued to the top? Oh, I'd love it. Where is it? I would love to have that. It'd be so good, dude. Um, I've got two clips from Bobo, so we'll just start with this first one. It's not the intro, but uh, it's um, just another good chunk of, of his interview. Really good interview for the Patreons who go back and listen to the whole thing. Um, yeah. But these are just a couple of my favorite spots. Okay. Now, are you, have you wrestled the Sheik recently? No, I haven't wrestled. Matter of fact, I haven't seen the Sheik now for uh, three or four years. Uh-huh. But you're, st- you're still active in wrestling. Now, you're involved with an independent organization out of the Detroit area, I believe. Right. Can you tell us about that? Huh? Can you tell us about that? Well, you know, I don't go too much. I wrestle, I wrestle about three or four times a month. Matter of fact, that's enough for me. And uh, matter, and matter of fact, it's too much, you know what I mean? Yes, sir. You know, I, you've been... I you, get about two a month, that'd be good. Well, it's not, it's not as though you haven't been uh, wrestling for a short period of time. You've been in the business for a long time. Well, I've been in the business for a long time. Matter of fact, I was in Indianapolis last night. You wrestled last night? Yes. Did you win? Oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah, I wrestled a guy by the name of Smash Stevens. Uh-huh. Now, your son is also active in professional wrestling yeah. now. I understand he's one of the top newcomers in the business. Yeah, he's been wrestling now for about three or four years. Have you teamed up with him at all? Oh, yeah, we had a couple of team matches. But he's going real good, but, you know, it's so hard to get a break in this business. Oh, it sure is. Yeah. Wrestling has changed so much over oh. the past five years. Yeah, you take when I was wrestling, you know, you can go to any territory, just call up and you can get in, you know. Yeah, especially with the yeah. reputation of a bubble Brazil. Yeah, they had so many promoters, but now they only got about three, four promoters that you can go and make what I mean, super money. Right. You know, like around New York, man, like, much like man, he's about the biggest promoter in the world today. Right. In your opinion, what what do you think of wrestling today compared to the yesteryear? Do you think it's better or worse? Well, uh... I think the boys are young and they can move a little bit faster than we could. We yeah. They make a million moves now. We didn't make that many moves, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but weren't the wrestlers rougher back in your day? Pardon me? Weren't they a little bit rougher back in your day? Well, you get more solid wrestlers back in my day, I put it that way. Like the Killer Kowalskis? Yeah, Killer Kowalski, Hunt Smith, Gene Konetsky, you know, those guys, they was rough and tough. We didn't make a lot of unnecessary moves like the boys make today, you know, like going up on the top rope and flying out in the middle of the ring, you know. Yeah, those those high-risk maneuvers. Right. But I tell you, you can't take anything away from the rest of the day because they are super good. (laughs) They give the fans they make with. Well, we've had Bruno Sammartino on the show several times. and (laughs) Bruno Sammartino doing now? Excuse me? What is he doing now? Uh, Bruno is... uh, Still kind of active in wrestling. He has like a 900 number uh-huh. where he speaks to the fans twice a week. They call him up and ask him questions on wrestling. Oh, good. And uh, he's just been uh, very <coughs> outspoken about the way wrestling has become. You know, he really wishes that it would come back to the way it used to be. Yeah. And I spoke to Luthez on, on that subject a few weeks back, and he wishes the same thing. <laughs> well, uh, just like I say, it's not too much. It's a lot of wrestling going on, but... The guys out, you know. They're easing the older fellas out to bring their new guys, which isn't too bad. That's what they should have, more younger boys in the rest of the day. Right. <coughs> well, we're going to take a commercial, <coughs> a commercial break. We'll be back in a little bit. Okay. Hello, everyone. This is the living legend of professional wrestling, Bruno San Martino. And you listen to Professional Wrestling Spotline with John Anthony on WNYG 1440 AM. <laughs> I was sort of like, what the hell was going on there? I was sick as a dog. You had bronchitis? Yeah. Brought it up. You think you got it at a Mets game? Oh, you really? In innings? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh. I believe the game went 10 innings. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's funny because it, it highly affects the whole show. Yeah, I'm choking the whole time. <laughs> Bobo responds. <laughs> okay, great. Going to break. 
<laughs> like you didn't even Bruno, listen to him. Bruno wrestling spotline. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So good. Uh yeah, and then there's another there's a few times that coming back from break you have like G Man or or Rob or I think there's even one time it's Bruce coming back from break and they're trying to get you back because like they're like reading the back thing like and now back to John Anthony as he's coughing up something in the back there and you're like hey hey guys <laughs> like, there's a few instances I didn't keep them all but for the patrons yeah, yeah well you can hear the whole thing if you want to hear me choke for a you know, a couple hours, just go right to the <laughs> patreon.com forward slash John Arezzi. Check out the episode. It's up there for your enjoyment. Huh. It's really good. It's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any, any Bobo stories? Did you work with him after this at all? Um, no, not at all. No, I uh, actually tried to get him at one of my conventions, but I was just never able to, um, but that was really, for me, that was kind of a special day just to be able to speak to him because I loved when I, uh, I had the opportunity to see him live and took a bunch of really good pictures of him when uh, when I was able to see him uh, perform. But uh, he was one of my favorites like when I was a kid. That's why I was so enamored with the uh, having him on because he really was. It was Bruno, it was Bobo, it was Antonio Pugliese, it was Spiro Sarion. And those were the guys. Those were my those were my favorites before Blassie. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. Did you uh, get any pictures of him backstage? No, I got pictures of him, but not with him. Yeah. So you got him like in ring photos. You didn't get any like backstage oh, yeah. little promo ones. No, I got I got a couple of, couple of shots of him in, in the backstage area, but I never took a picture of me with him together. Yeah. But I, I do have uh, I do have quite a few of them actually from those television tapings and also a couple of shots at Madison square garden yeah. where I was able to shoot, uh, some photos of him as well. Well, send me a couple of those and we'll throw a few in. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'll definitely do that. Yeah. Why not? I'll definitely do Picture, that. Like it. Get, no, it was kind of neat. Go ahead. Yeah. It was kind of neat before I, um, um, before we get back to this is like, because of the, uh, the project I was involved with in Philly, I brought a lot of contact sheets uh, back in the day. You'd have these contact sheets where, you know, that you could see all the pictures on the negative. And, and I, and I pulled a lot of the uh, magazines uh, that uh, the subject matter for this episode was in. Uh, and, um, and I was just kind of amazed at, you know, how many pictures that I took just so many that were published and of this individual in the magazines, but, uh, and looking at those contact sheets, I'm like, wow. I mean, this stuff is like, it's incredible what I've captured. And, and there's not, when you look at it, Napolitano, uh, you know, is the only one that probably has a, a vast bigger archives than, than I. And every time I speak to George, he doesn't know where half the stuff is. Hmm. And after, you know, didn't own any of his pictures because it was owned by the company, yeah. Pro Wrestling Illustrated. So I still think I got a treasure chest of stuff. Yeah, and Donnie sold his. Donnie sold his. That's unfortunate. Do you know who he sold it to? He never disclosed that. I don't know why. He just, you know, that's, he's keeping it kayfabe. <laughs> but that's a specific thing. Of all things, you, you, he's, I sold it. And you went to him was like, ah, it's not important, John. How crazy. Yeah, he won't tell He won't tell me. That's wild. He's got to be an arch nemesis from long ago. He sold it all to Vince Russo. <laughs> <laughs> can only imagine. Yeah. Can only imagine. Um, but yeah, no, you've got amazing stuff. And that's why, I mean, I've told you before. I mean, and I'm sure that anyone would agree that, yo, I've got equipment to digitize some of this stuff. I'm like, let's let's start doing it in bulk. You know, let's get this stuff someplace. But at the same time, just even as it stands, it's a treasure trove. It is. And I hope someday that someone will come along and say, we're taking this from you. So go fade into the sunset and retire. And I think that will eventually happen because I heard of some rumors this uh, in the last seven days 
There's yeah. some rumors about some things uh, on the documentary front and the future of uh, some projects are going to be worked on, especially, you know, now that Endeavor is kind of, they're doing some amazing things. So, yeah. um, so anyway, it's just a little, it planted a seed and I'm like, well, if they ever need that, you know, films and pictures and videos. And I mean, the pictures and the, and the films alone are priceless, I think. Yeah. I think it's amazing. Some of those ones, like the amount of pictures. I was, was going to put everything on. I was going to put everything on Facebook Marketplace. You think I should do that? Like the whole just thing put it up there and just say OBO. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Here you go. Yeah. What do you think this is worth? Probably good. Forty dollars. Yeah. But, you have to pick it up yourself, um, though. I'm not going to deliver it. <laughs> I'm on a crazy mood home. today, so let's go. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm, you know, I'm, yeah, there's so I'm already many. like. Half a brain is my Mets already today. Oh, yeah. It's happening. Uh, let's listen to the last section I have of the Bobo interview. I liked how it ended. Okay. I uh, just want to apologize once again to everyone out there. I do have a bad case of bronchitis today, so if I'm coughing, uh, I'll try to keep it down a little bit. We're back on the phone with Bobo Brazil. Bobo, you still there with us? Yeah. Okay. What do you what do you think? Uh, who are the top wrestlers in the business today, in your opinion? Well, uh, I think Hulk Hogan is one of the greatest wrestlers today. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a big boy. He's a big boy. You know, I like the way he carries himself. Well, well, he just appeals to the youngsters, and uh, he does have a great persona for the young folks out there. Yeah, well, he got a he have a big following too. You know, he know how to talk, and he know how to speak when to speak. He treats everybody nice. So mm -hmm. he's very nice guy. And who, in your opinion, was the greatest wrestler of all time? At my time? Yes, in all, t in all time. In your opinion, who was the very best wrestler? Well, I say that two guys give me the worst problem in the ring was Killer Kowalski and the Sheik. Mm -hmm. And Dick the Bruiser, he was, he was number three. Right. Some real rough customers there. You can say that again. We had Killer on last week. Uh -huh. We had Killer Kowalski on with us last week. Oh, yeah? And he runs a very successful wrestling school now in Boston, and he also promotes some shows up there. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, he was, I remember him with Bruno San Martino and uh, some real wars they fought with each other. Uh, Tell me some of the places that you and your son and, you, and uh, this group, where are, you, where are you guys running shows now? Well, we're just running local shows and... Uh, I'm not flying too much anymore. Mm -hmm. I had a chance to go to Japan. I heard about that for the old timer series. Yeah, the 29th of this month. But I turned it down. Uh huh. I don't care to go overseas anymore. Well, you must have been there many times. Oh, I've been there many times. But I don't have nothing against Japan. They treat, they treat me just like a champion there, you know. Mm -hmm. They treat me real nice. But I'm just tired of flying around the country. Right. And. I guess when you get married, you get tired anyway. Well, Bobo, you've been uh, active in professional wrestling for many years, one of the historic figures of the business. Uh, if you ever make it to New York, uh, please look us up. We'd love to have you on here live. And uh, best of luck to you and your son uh, wrestling in that area. And we hope to uh, hear more about you uh, in the wrestling magazines and as uh, we uh, cover the sport here. Bobo, it's been a pleasure talking to you, sir. Nice talking to you. Okay, bye-bye now. That was Bobo Brazil, legendary figure and uh, master of the Coco butt. Bobo is uh, up in this, around the, in his age, close to 70 years old, still wrestling. So uh, that says something about why he doesn't want to travel anymore. He's been in the business for a long time. But I'll tell you one thing, uh, back in the 60s and even the 70s, the wars he had with the Sheik, the original Sheik, uh, were, just had to be seen to be believed. Unbelievable, unbelievable wars. Okay. From Benton Harbor, Michigan, Bobo Brazil. If you listen closely, you cut him off. It's funny. Like he's starting to say something else and you just click. And then, all right, guys. And then, like, you go to an ad break. I think you felt it in your throat again. Probably. Yeah, I was feeling yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Because you kind of radio eat. show. You can't talk. It's crazy. You had two hours to do and you couldn't talk. Um, yeah, and then this one, like, you can hear right at the end. You're like, all right, well, thanks for coming on and spending time. And he's like, all right, just a bit. And you just, like, click. And you're click. like, yep, that was Bobo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
but it was cool. So I'm surprised he never came back on again. But I guess he really didn't do like yeah, a lot. Because they cut him off. <laughs> yeah. That, but also like I, when you think about it, he was doing some some local stuff. But I can't imagine for too many more years, right? No. No, it didn't last long. It didn't get anywhere. Yeah. And he was only promoting locally. Probably yeah. just to get his son yeah. over more than anything else. Oh, who's the son? I guess Bobo Brazil Jr. <laughs> Jr. <laughs> son is it's Daddy Bobo. Take this dagger and stick it in my heart. <laughs> if you want to take over. I would have did it to your grandpappy. <laughs> I got him right in front of your mom. <laughs> uh, let's see I didn't have a note on that one cause, but I did like hearing them, uh, what do you think of the people nowadays they're doing so many moves they're doing too many moves they're just so yeah. many moves and you're like yeah well he'd be, this- he'd be in there with finger locks and head locks and hammer locks and yeah he didn't fly he wasn't a flyer yeah. You know that was cool. Him against Ernie the Cat Lad. No kidding. Those were two big guys. And they worked well against each other. Yeah. That's awesome. Did you ever see Ernie Ladd? No. He was a former uh, NFL football player. Oh. And he was amazing. And he used to have this gimmick where his, uh, it was one of the original. Uh, thumb, tape the thumb up and jab it in the throat, mm-hmm. guys. Ernie Ladd, and he's just like, and he and he never called the announcers by their name. Well, he would say, "Mr. TV announcer." <laughs> that's, how, that's how he called. Uh, I definitely have heard a lot of Ernie Ladd stories between uh, Jim Ross and Cornette, and I think Bruce Pritchard tells a few Ernie Ladd fo- stories too, but. Yeah, the one that always sticks out was the 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 you're stealing money, Bundy. Yeah. <laughs> Every time you cash that check. <laughs> Mr. TV announcer. That's awesome. Legends. Let's see. You go over the the having bronchitis again. You talk about getting it a Mets game. Let's see. Um, Some things never change. Yeah. So you start reviewing No Holds Barred, and you uh, ask people to call in and talk to you about No Holds Barred because you had seen it. You did say it's better than you thought it was going to be. <laughs> oh, really? What was I smoking? How I probably bad went did to you the think theater. it was going to be? I probably went, it probably went to the theater, uh, smoked a dube, and put one of my my uh, action figure hats on and watched it there. <laughs> I thought it was better than I thought it would be. You're like, you know what? This could have been bad. <laughs> Instead, it's terrible. <laughs> uh, but you have people calling. Have you ever seen it? Yeah, yeah. You have. What'd you think? Yeah, it's wild. Loved it, didn't you? <laughs> It's so crazy to watch that stuff and the whole <laughs> it's dookie. <laughs> <laughs> it's dookie. <It's> so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah, I think that it's funny. Uh but yeah, you you thought it was better than you thought it was going to be and you asked people mm. to call in one of your callers. I don't think we got up this one, but maybe we did. Um it might be this one color that I pulled up next because you started talking about it. I believe he says he has no intention of watching it, which is awesome. Wow. Um, but let's get this caller because I think this is right around the time you were talking about No Holds Barred. Okay. Do you remember watching? Did you go to the theaters to see it? Well, how else are you going to do it back then, <laughs> 35 years ago? <laughs> So, I mean, that's part of it too, right? You go all the way to like spending the money and getting the the snacks. You can't like, it really sucks when you just don't have, when you have a miserable time, you have to at least be like, you know what? It was a good theater. It was, yeah, they handled things well. Like it was probably why I liked it a little bit because it was on the big screen. 
Yeah, because I am a movie guy. Like I am a movie guy. I go every week. I go to the big theater. I go to IMAX. I love the theater experience. I know. I try to impress you whenever I go. We've been twice now, and I don't even know if I told you about the last two of them. We, went to, we saw the Beetlejuice one, and we saw Deadpool. Oh, I love that one. I haven't seen Deadpool, Deadpool yet, or Wolverine. The, the Deadpool Wolverine one's incredible. I didn't see it yet. I, the last one, that movie I saw was Beetlejuice. Did you watch the first one before going to see that one? I saw Beetlejuice when it came out in the theaters. Yeah, that was years 300 ago. years ago, dude. It was like 30 years ago, wasn't it? <laughs> so you don't have to remember all of it. I, I, I probably saw it multiple times. I liked it so, so much. You did but not? Then, well, back then you'd go, you know, you, you couldn't stream anything. So if you liked the film and you wanted to see it again, you go back to the theater. I think I saw Saturday Night Live seven or eight times in the theater in the 70s. You could see Saturday, Saturday Night Live or Saturday Night Fever? No, Saturday Night Fever. I'm sorry, Saturday okay. Night Fever. And a Taxi oh, Driver. Does Saturday Night do fucking pay-per-view? Taxi Driver I saw multiple times. Oh. Yes. I, if I liked the movie, I, I saw E.T. I think four or five times in the theaters. Um. I yeah, like, and that makes okay. sense. But I watched Beetlejuice right before you went to go see it, and I started noticing things that were like annoying to me right away. And I was like, okay. Okay. Uh, but, but it was good. Either way, you get a caller, Ken. Ken. <laughs> yeah. Ken and from Amityville? Paid... Yes. Ken from Amityville. Ken Povaldetti. What did he do? Well, he's still in the business. He's, uh, he, he does uh, private autograph signings. That's cool. In Amityville still. He still does it. Wow. I did one when my book came out with him. That's fantastic. Yeah. Huh. Well, here he I is. I forgot the name like of the company. Cool. Yeah, he's uh, he stayed in the business. That's he got in the business and stayed in it. So let's hear him. Uh, 661-1440 is the number here at the Pro Wrestling Spotlight. Let's talk to Ken from Amityville. Ken. Hi, John. How are you? Fine. Um... Uh, you saw uh, the video yesterday with uh, Dusty Rhodes, right? Yes, I did. Was it, you, uh, it was typical WWF cartoon. Yeah. Uh, Dusty Rhodes was delivering pizza to somebody, yeah. uh, some uh, girl, and he was delivering a sardine pizza to her. Yeah. And uh, at the end of it, she goes, hey, aren't you? And all of a sudden, on the screen, it flashes a big, the American dream, and Dusty winks at the camera and yeah. drives off in his beat-up 69 Volkswagen <clears throat> Beetle. So, um, yeah, they're definitely going to uh, have some fun with Dusty. Are you glad to have him in, or I mean, to see him in? I wrestled Dusty before. I'm, I'd like to get him back in the ring, to tell you the truth. No. <laughs> uh, no, I, you know, Dusty's going to draw for them. There's no question about it. Uh, he's well, he, he didn't do too good in uh, Florida. Well, he didn't have McMahon's money behind him either. Yeah, uh, he has the Now he has national TV coverage, cable TV coverage, pay-per-view coverage. They could build him as far as, uh, as far as they want to. You know, look what they did with Zeus. Guy's never been in the ring before, and they're already going to put him in the main events. Yeah. So with Dusty Rhodes, who has a track record, who held the NWA world title, and uh, he's perfect for what uh, the WWF is right now. Um, and um, I think you heard this already, but uh, at uh, SummerSlam, the main event would be... Uh, it's a tag match now. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's obvious that uh, they want uh, to have, like, a, like, they have Savage and Zeus against Hogan and uh, Beefcake because of... Um, None of those guys except Savage is a good wrestler. Right. And um, they have to keep the match, I guess, you know, it's going to have to, you know, be pretty good. But uh, Well, I'm just anxious to see this guy Zeus in there. You know, uh, I think they're very, they're very scared about this guy going into the ring, to tell you the truth. Um, because he really doesn't know what, you know, he doesn't, he's not listening to uh, the people who are training him. And it's just, a, there's a lot of uh, discrepancies going on right now. I think he'll be uh, maybe a little bit uh, tag team tournament. Yes, I did. With the Minute Express and... Um, Butch Reed and yes, I did. I thought, Reed. It was, I thought it was very good. It wasn't a bad match, but um, I heard that Bob Orton was fired. Bob Orton has been fired from the NWA. That is correct. So, yeah, okay. And, um, uh, okay, uh, the Pound Twins, you said that they might be in this week? or Well, they're out so They're out in the Hamptons beating some people up, from what I understand. They're bouncing in some nightclubs this weekend. Yeah. And they, uh, they're definitely, uh, they might be calling in later. Sorry, who is this? This is Ken. Yeah. There's another, there's a piece of paper in front of me. I'm sorry. Don't worry about it, Ken. Talk to you next week, buddy. Okay, bye. Bye. Ooh, what the hell was going on there? I mean, was my NyQuil kicking in? There was, was all, all sorts of stuff. 
Yeah, there was a good chunk of this where the speed was going up and down, and I wonder if your tape might have been a little messed up. So I, I tried not to pull too much from that portion of the tape, but yeah, this overlapped into it. But it's just good because the guy was goofing with you about Dusty and everything. You know, Dusty's in there and he's doing his thing. And yeah, and Dusty, that was pre, uh, that was pre debut. So you know, we hadn't seen him in the polka dots yet. So you we were hoping beyond hope that he would be treated nicely. Uh, but that was like the end of it. As soon as he debuted in the polka dots, that was the end of it for me. <laughs> Funky like I mean, a I monkey, just... brother. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's cool because you go back and watch the stuff prior to that and, you know, after that too. And it's all like so timeless and so well done. But I also think yeah. about just my age at the time. I never thought twice about the polka dots being like a bad thing. Like we loved it. Oh, well, that's because you were a kid. You were into that cartoon garbage. That's true. <laughs> oh, you that's what they were marketing to. But, you know, when yeah. you looked at Dusty, when I saw Dusty, you know, in his heyday and in the NWA and the matches with Flair and that those feuds and even his run in the WWWF where they should have gave him the title. They yeah. really should have because he had it all. He should have gotten that belt. I think it definitely would have been interesting if it had worked out in the way. Cause I mean, you'll see, I don't know if you got into that episode yet, Vince about how he wanted it to be dusty and, yeah. you know, look out for the reasons it didn't. And so that's why he went Hulk. Hulk was his second choice. So it would have been cool to see how wrestling would have looked if it had gone the other way. Cause I think they would look largely the same. Mm-hmm. Well, they should have given the title, the dusty above Backlund, I think. Mm hmm. Because yeah. he would have he would have carried the torch and you know Backlund it took them a long time to get him over even though he you know had a very long run, but Dusty instead of Backlund would have been really special. Yeah, I think so. I think it'd been great. Um, but at the same time, if you don't have Dusty not getting the title, you don't have Cody finishing the story. That's true. That story was finished. Yeah. So who knows what's next? Right. But I mean, also like what would, what would Cody's, what would have been of Cody if Dusty was just the champion for a long time? Like Hogan, you know what I mean? Like what would the business look like now, now with the bright players, Cody might not be, right. or he might be for another reason, a big deal, you know, it's just nuts. What could have been. <laughs> yep. Uh, let's see. We have a couple that we have. Where's my notes on this one? Dusty there. Okay, so someone brings this up. You have a caller. I didn't clip it, but I want to talk to you about it. He said that Scott Hall, he had just heard that Scott Hall had been signed with WCW. And that he also heard that Lord Humongous was signed with uh, WCW. And Sid. he goes, but isn't... He said, but he said, isn't that the same guy? Yeah. He goes, I thought Scott Hall was Lord Humongous. And you said, I don't know anything about that. I don't know who that is. But Lord Humongous, as you were stating, is largely known as Sid Vicious. Right? So that's who we know Mm -hmm. we're talking about. However, it looks like when I looked into it a little bit, Scott Hall wrestled as Lord Humongous in Florida in 89. Wow. Wow. I didn't know that. I don't remember that. So it's a little weird. And I reported that Scott had just signed or just left WCW. Or he just came in. You didn't report him being signed even. The caller called in and said he'd read that he'd been signed. Yeah, because I I think I did promos with him at the Great American Bash or right around that time where I got a chance to interview him and have him do a couple of promos for the show. He was in and out of there pretty quick. It wasn't that it wasn't a long, long run there. Yeah, no. Um, But it was interesting. And it also made me wonder, too, because if he was Florida for less than a year as Lord Humongous, why would a guy in New York? be like hey isn't that same guy that would that would have been right. close it's not to say someone from florida couldn't have moved there right but yeah that's interesting yeah. yeah just a cool little tidbit i found and i thought i would share it 
Um, Cause yeah, I was looking it up. I couldn't remember. I knew Lord Humongous was somebody I knew and it was it obviously, but then I saw that one little blurb and I was like, Oh shoot. Um, this is a clip of Sonny Blaze. As you're talking about No Holds Barred being awful, Sonny walks in. Like on the oh. air, you're like, oh, hey, how you doing? Sonny just walked in. You're like, okay. Uh, so he kind of pops in and out through a, a number of these. But this is Sonny um, getting triggered by somebody mentioning a name. Is he coughing too? He's is not he coughing, coughing is, a lot. It's probably why you turned almost every interview over to him for a bit. Hey, Sonny has a few questions for you. Probably was for your own throat. Yeah. Sonny, please. G Man, are you going to that show by by any stretch of the imagination? I understand you might be uh, attending it. Yeah, I am going to the uh, the uh, show here. So uh, you'll be our official representative of the Pro Wrestling Spotlight at the National I will be your, your right hand man. I'm going to the 50th anniversary of the Hall of Fame. How about you want, you want to switch? Could I go to the 50th no, no, anniversary? No, no, no. I'm going to have you watch Andre versus Big John Studd. Uh, match of the year, that should be. Okay, I'll, I'll be there in uh, in my uh, glory, all my glory. Maybe you'll be the ring announcer. No, Marty Pereira, I heard, is going to be it. I heard he's going to uh, be the ring announcer. I don't ever want to hear that name a mentioned anywhere near me again. You got it? Oh, I'm sorry there, Broadway. Why don't you want to hear it ever mentioned again in my in your presence? Broadway has a uh, bone to pick with Marty. If he called me any more often, I'd have to adopt him. He calls you? What is he calling you for, though? <laughs> no, I, I wanted to ask you something, John. Sure, go ahead. Now, before that guy, Ken, he said that Hulk Hogan's not much of a wrestler. <laughs> Basically true, but haven't you noticed a marked improvement in his wrestling since teaming with the Macho Man? Yeah, I think that some of that Macho Man, some of the Macho Man's ability, ability might have rubbed off. I believe so. I also believe Brutus Beefcake has become a much better wrestler recently. The well, past I year think, or two. I think, uh, giving uh, credit where credit is due here, the last show, the Saturday Night Main <clears throat> event from last week, was uh, the best I've seen. Uh, the wrestlers all worked very hard. It was a good, it was a good show, and one including Hulk, the suplex off the cage, and that was very good. Oh, that was outrageous! Mm -hmm. Two men that size being able to do that. Um, the Hartford, Connecticut show, yes. the bus trip. Does that mark the first time the first time that the Midnight Express is re wrestling in the NWA? Oh uh, yeah, no, they wrestled. Uh, they're back already. They wrestled on the TV tapes yesterday. Oh, I haven't uh, been watching. Right? Yeah, and they uh, they should be it, probably in the finals against the SST. In the main event, uh, you know, based how these guys have been performing recently, uh, we have to take another break first. Okay, we'll take a break. We'll come back with Don Liable right after this. Broadway, Sunny Blaze. Why did he not want the name Marty Pereira set around him ever again? I guess because Marty was annoying him with constant phone calls. He's this big, big number one fan. Well, there's a, you know, enough is enough sometimes. This yeah, is the sixth cool. time you're calling me today, Marty. What do you want to know? <laughs> do you know when the Wu Ways is going to wrestle again? <laughs> Man, there was Marty's one. Marty's a legend. He, Marty's a legend. And it sounds like he's still around. You don't, he doesn't he's come on Texas. at this point. He lives in Texas. Now, I'm saying right here, there's a few things you say and do that makes it sound like Marty's on the other side of the glass. But maybe. But he never says maybe. anything. No, he's, he's forbidden. <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen, you can't stop people from walking in, right? Yeah. No, apparently not. Definitely not there. That door had no locks. That's yeah, for I don't sure. think the NYG uh, uh, front of the building even had a lock. <laughs> no point. No, I did have a shower though. I had a shower in there though. Did you make Marty shower? <laughs> <laughs> it was a bizarre. Feels like something. Feels like something you and the twins would have done. Hey, Marty. It haunted basement. <laughs> it was a haunted basement. Yeah. It was a bizarre place, brother. 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 Bro. So good. Um. But yeah, Sonny was hanging around. Uh, I do have a clip from Donnie. He comes on, gives a big, big report, talks a ton he, of new stuff. Did he talk about who he sold his negatives to in this uh, segment? He did not. He talked a little bit about going to the Baseball Hall, Hall of Fame soon. Yeah, um, the 50th anniversary, I guess, it was we were gearing up to yeah. go. Sounds like the 50th, right? Um, mm -hmm. 
he took a couple questions from Sonny because Sonny was talking about with Flair uh, potentially going to WWE with um, Arn and Tully there and Wyndham and JJ Dillon. You brought up. He starts talking about like you think they're going to try to reform the Four Horsemen in WWF. And um, one of the things that was notable and fun to me was Sonny said, "Well, couldn't they do it with Lex Luger?" And then Donnie's like, well, I could see that. Because he was saying, like, he didn't see how anybody would work. And Sonny pitched Lex Luger. And, I mean, they did eventually put Lex Luger in the Four Horsemen. So I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, This is my one clip from Donnie, though. It's him. Oh. Uh, You tried to cut him off. He said, that's <laughs> enough, Donnie. <laughs> and he goes, one more thing. Uh, And I thought this was great. Hey. Well, Don, you know, we really appreciate your comments here, as usual. And uh, you still there? Yes, John. Okay. Uh, one other point I'd like to mention, uh, maybe some of your callers in weeks to come could think about this and perhaps give their opinions, is on the state of uh, women in professional wrestling. Now, in, in recent years, uh, valets and you've had your glow and your pow and, and that type of wrestling. And I'm not knocking because they do their thing and they do it well. But I think with the emergence of that type of uh, women activity in wrestling, it has hurt women wrestlers. And, and I'm talking about the greats, not only Mula, but there was Cora Combs, June Byers, Ella Waldick. Uh, in recent years, there's Vicki Williams, Donna Cristinella. And women wrestlers did one thing. They wrestled. They didn't uh, show things off. Uh, they, they were there to be athletes and not to be uh, um, looked upon as other. And I think two of the best girl wrestlers going today, uh, you don't hear too much about, but I think you will be in the, in the future, uh, is Debbie Combs, who at one time was the NWA Women's World Champion, and Medusa Michelli, who was the American Wrestling Association's World Champion. Uh, I think those are the two best girls going, and I've had many uh, reports and letters sent to me that uh, there's a feud brewing between them, and I think it's going to be leaving the attorney's office and getting into the ring. So, Well, they're both top-notch wrestlers. Oh, Maybe sure. we could try to get them both on the pro wrestling spotlight to uh, to see how they feel about each John, other. I know uh, a good possibility because I know they both know of your show. In fact, uh, before we went on the air, I was speaking with Debbie Combs, and uh, she has a lot to sound off on, and uh, it's certainly a good vehicle uh the pro wrestling spotlight to do it on. Well, you talk to Debbie and tell her that we'd like to get her on maybe even with Medusa next weekend and we'll okay. see where we could start up here. Okay. All right, Don, listen, thanks again for your report and I'll see you in Cooperstown next weekend. Thank you very much, John. Okay, take care, buddy. Debbie Combs, Nashville girl. She uh, became a, a deputy sheriff and I think she still works for law enforcement here in Nashville. Wow. She like a top sheriff or warden kind of a deal, something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And of course, That's crazy. Deborah Medusa, she's still yeah. very active. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is one of the first times we've heard you mention her. You mentioned her one other time. Yeah, this is one cool. of the first times. Yeah, and Donnie referring to her as Medusa Michelli, which means it was very mm -hmm. early on in her goings because she dropped Michelli at some point. I'll be seeing um, her next weekend. Yeah, ask her about this. Say, hey, what was the deal going on here? You know? <laughs> See if she can't remember uh, if she was trying to get a program going with Debbie Combs behind your back. Because it looks like they were going to try and use behind her Behind my back? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, but definitely, that would be the first thing I do when I see her next weekend. Yeah. Hey, hey what were you trying to do with Debbie Combs with up behind my back back in 1989? <laughs> Deborah. <laughs> give me, she'd give me a karate kick to the throat, and that'll be the end of it. <laughs> she'd give you one of them. Are you fucking. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Uh, but I thought that was really cool. It was really nice to hear Donnie put her over two of the ones. It sounds like. And then you even say at the outro, you're saying we're going to try and get. Uh, uh, Debbie Combs and Medusa Michelli on next week. So you guys spoiler are alert. spoiler alert. It didn't happen. You know, did you? Did Deborah you think you got to do the show? She didn't do the show and for quite a while. Yeah. yeah. Did you know her yet, or you just seen her around? I did not know her at all. Okay. 
Yeah, I was just curious. Um, just because the way you're like, oh, I'll reach out. I was like, did you know her even? So. I had everybody's number. I just, you know, you reach out to somebody. And a lot of times oh. she said she'd come on and then she'd change her mind and then she eventually came on. She was always very suspicious of why I wanted her to be on the show. Yeah, what are you trying to get? You could see that. Um, outside of that, that brings us into, we're a little over halfway there. Uh, you bring on Mario Savaldi for quite some time. It's like a 15 minute interview. Yeah. Maybe it's eight minutes. Yeah. Yeah. We were, I was starting to do uh, a little work with them, uh, announcing stuff for his TV tapings. Um, just getting to know him and I knew Mario, uh, back from the seventies. Because his father was always Angelo Savoldi was, um, you know, was a wrestler known for his cauliflower ears. And every time he get hit, he cover his ear up. And he was, and then he became, you know, part of the office uh, with WWWF. And and he threw me out of a few places, you know, when I was seen at at a IWA show. And I was trying to get in good with him, at least to have him stop stop uh, throwing me out of places and. So I, I uh, and Mario was a referee for the WWWF. So I actually uh, wrote a story on Mario for Ring Wrestling Magazine, and I took pictures of him and his dad Angelo, and uh, and so it was a really it was a, it was a good article, and you know I made sure that uh, I gave him the rub, as they say. So he, so you know maybe his father would treat me kindly. So that was the work? that was the. Yeah. Ulterior- the ulterior motive there. It did work actually. And I got to know him. I got to know Mario. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you end up getting to use Angelo for any of your conventions or anything? No. No. Right. No. Or Mario. Huh. All right. I never got paid when I did my announcing. I oh, remember yeah, Sonny Blaze and I, Sonny Blaze and I, driving through a blizzard to go to Hutcher, Cutcher's up in upstate New York and do TV, and we're like, we didn't get, we didn't get a penny. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Well, that makes sense. Uh, it does. Well, why does it make sense? Should it makes sense why you didn't work. It makes sense why you didn't use him for a bunch of other stuff. You're not gonna like, yeah. hey, I'll pay you to come right. out here. Right. He's not gonna pay you to come out. That's exactly right. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense at all. But we're Uh, friends on Facebook. (laughs) Yeah, I don't think he was doing it because he was hoping to hurt you. You know? No, no, no. no. The business was back then. You know, Mitch Seinfeld, all those guys. You know, Tommy D, Tendler. Whoever got paid? No one got paid. (laughs) No one's getting paid around here. Be happy to be there. Yeah, that was was the Jerry Jarrett thing too. The Jerry going into the thing and not telling everyone to get off, don't be on drugs or steroids. And they're like, we, with what you, uh, with what you pay, we can't even afford food. You know, yeah. like we're not on the gas. We're not even on food. That's um, one thing about the wrestling business. You should be happy to be working, even though you don't get paid. Which is such a weird thing, right? Like thing, you should be happy to be working. And you're like, but working means you get paid. And like, no, no, no. <laughs> Not in this business. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Matter of fact, you have to pay to even be on the radio. You have to pay us. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I have half. I have the the tail end of the Mario Savaldi interview. Uh, It is very heavy promoting a show he's got coming up. People who he's going to have on there. uh, Some young talent, but uh, a lot of legends and stuff. Uh, Do you know how long he promoted for? He promoted for several years. Yeah, he did. He promoted uh, for several years. The most infamous thing is that when he had Tony Atlas and Vic Steamboat for the ICW championship, he must have aired that match hundreds of times on his TV tapings. Yeah, he had some sort of deal with one of the channels. Yeah, he was on Sports Channel. Yeah. Yeah. Why would you but he's been doing it and it's like you see and now he's in the video you know he's like he owns archives video archives of a lot of indie promotions that's cool so that's where he he's still making a living at it doing that that's nuts very historic family he comes from very historic 
And his brother, uh, Tom Savoldi, was a referee as well. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, well, let's take a listen here. This is Mario. Mario! This is Paisan. But we're really not an independent group anymore. I think we're really someone that they're going to have to open their eyes and say, hey, there's a new guy in town, and they better take a look at us. Well, it looks like you're running even more now than uh, one of the big three, so to speak, the AWA. It looks like you're uh, a lot more active than they are. Well, we feel right at this point, especially with our television and nothing against the AWA. They're an active group and everything else, but we we feel, and, and our, we're, we're either head-to-head -head with them or maybe we've just passed them with these two acquisitions of these two new stations. So we're, we're really off, and I think, again, I'm just, I don't want to be repetitious, but they got to come see us to enjoy us. Well, that sounds great because there's a... Uh there's no, really no place for a lot of young talent to get exposure, and it looks like the ICW will be filling that void and developing some of the top newcomers in the wrestling business, and that's something that uh, the sport really needs, and uh, congratulations to Mario Savoldi and the ICW for doing this. Mario, incidentally, you come from a very famous wrestling family yourself. Yeah, uh, you've been in business for a long time. Yes, sir. Uh, tell us about... Uh, well, you've transpired. You used to be a referee at one time. Well, I don't know if you... I was a referee with the WWF. And your dad was one of the uh, famous wrestlers for the WWF back in the 60s. Yeah, well, my dad, uh, my dad, I believe, held the uh, the NWA Junior Heavyweight Champion. I believe he held it for 12 years. I think it was the longest it, it, it was ever held. And well, at, at that point, his competition was such people as Vern Gagne and Leroy McGurk and uh, Dory Funk, Terry Funk, and some of the major talent. So you certainly have the background to uh, to run the organization, the ICW, and uh, obviously the, the keen eye for talent. And we wish you the best of luck. And uh, hopefully here at the Pro Wrestling Spotlight, uh, we can do all we can uh, to help your organization out. Well, we really appreciate it. You know, a big, uh, I, one of the things is that, you know, being so involved with wrestling and everything else, John, you know, we, I learned a lot starting out as a, as, as a referee and, building up into promotions, and, and I guess I owe a lot, most of everything I owe is to my dad, Angelo Savoldi, but I owe a lot to Vince McMahon Sr. too, because the man was a great promoter, and, and he really knew how to handle people, and uh, that's why I wish Vince McMahon the best of whatever he gets. Well, that's great. Mario, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and the best of luck with the ICW. All our listeners will uh, obviously be watching this new and exciting promotion, and uh, we wish nothing but the best for you. Really good, John. I just want to say to those fans, man, if you want to see some exciting wrestling, come see the ICW. All right. Thank you very much, Mario thank Savoli. Thank you. And he did bring in a lot of guys, his TV tapings, and he had uh, Tony Rumble as one of the announcers, and he had a lot of interesting stuff. Paul E. took the book for a while when Paul E. was fired mm. uh, first time from W from NWA WCW. Um, so yeah, it, it was he did some pretty cool things. Hmm, that's pretty good. Did he was he like short lived in the promoting of it and got into other aspects of the business? Because you said he's still around in wrestling. Yeah, yeah, he's still around. He promoted for quite a while. Yeah, in huh. the late eighties, early nineties. Yeah, but he never went on to uh, sell kitchen appliances. Yeah, no, no, he did not. He uh, so. does not hang out at Costco. All right, so he didn't steal Mitch's gimmick, which is nope. important. No, nope. <laughs> I don't think Mitch would allow it. <laughs> no way, no chance. Uh. Do you have any crazy Mario stories? How much did you work around him? Every time I brought up that Savoldi's on this, you like couldn't believe it. <laughs> Almost. Um, it was just kind of a running joke because he was notoriously cheap and not mm -hmm. pay. And and that's why even Ted Petty, when he went on the IWAS uh, Southeast Asia tour, uh, we built him. And, you know, he wore a mask as Cheetah Kid. And another time he'd be... You know, honest Mario Savoldi was how he wanted to be announced. That's right. That's right. From Parsippany, New Jersey, honest Mario Savoldi. <laughs> and that was a running gag on that tour. So all you guys are dying in the back as he's out there waving. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Honest Mario all Savoldi. Right. Very good. Uh, this was and he was not show. dishonest, I don't think. I don't think he was dishonest. 
think he was honest. He just never paid you. Oh, I'm well, I mean, there's the being slight, being disingenuous is different than just being like a flat out liar, you know, like yeah. being a little skeezy. Like he never said, you know, come on down. I'm going to pay you a hundred bucks or 200 or 25 or whatever, or gas money. It was like, you show up. Yeah, we'll take care of you. Yeah. We'll put you to work. <laughs> Exposure. <laughs> yeah. Come on down. We'll put you to work. No problem. Um, Bruce read, he was doing a bunch of live reads. He did the LNS. She talked about how they had 25 cases last week of the uh, LJNs. Now they only have three. But Bo- Bruce read, <laughs> he read Adam from Long Beach. Adam Horowitz had just started doing Between the Ropes. Okay. So that was a live read? Yeah, it was a live read advertisement for Adam Horowitz Between the Ropes. I wonder if I got was, paid for that. Was that the the young kid? That was an Andrew no. Goldberger. No. no, no, no. Okay. Uh, who was Adam Horowitz? He, I guess he calls him Adam from Long Beach all the time. Yeah, he was a fan. Yeah. Probably, you know, read Meltzer or some of the others and then kind of rehash it and put it in his own form. Send it out. Yeah. I wonder if he actually paid you for a spot. Good question. Because I would have to imagine that he would. I haven't kept my business records from there. I don't have my business (laughs) records from back then. You're like, hold on. I have the form right here. Uh, Yeah, I just wonder if he... um, because you didn't put over between the ropes a ton. And I took note of that. I was like, which one is this? Why haven't I heard this one? So I got to imagine he just thought he would blast it where other guys would just call in and say it. I got a question for you, but also I do this newsletter. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't pay a lot of attention to it. It was probably, you know, here and gone before you know it, before like a blink of an eye. Mm, I got you. It was an interesting time though, Marsh. No. Yeah. The smart fans were beginning to ascend on the business. They were happening. The newsletter business became a business. Uh, we got a clip from Sunny. These last three are a little Sunny centric, if I'm going to be honest. But it was yeah, well, because sunny. at the end of the show, you guys were kind of yeah. just shooting the shit. Yeah. I always like that banter at the end. Yeah. He always, and you can hear it in his voice, he doesn't want to use the mic unless he thinks he's going to actually help the show. Like, he doesn't want to waste your time. You know what I mean? You can hear deliberateness in what he's saying and thoughtfulness. Yes, he's always, he was always that way. And incidentally, I'll be heading up to Mario Savoldi's ICW tapes uh, June 14th, 15th, 16th. And I'll be the guest color commentator, and hopefully my bronchitis will be cleared by then so I don't uh, screw up his program like I'm screwing up my own program today. And Broadway Sunny Blaze is now negotiating and will possibly be signed by the ICW uh, to start working there against some of the top talent and uh, could be a good shot in the arm for you, Broadway, in your career. Well, I appreciate you working that out for me. I just want to say something about the world-class wrestling. Uh, one of the gentlemen who trained me, is, is their former light heavyweight champion. Cactus Jack? Cactus Jack Manson. He's one of the tops in the Good friend of mine. Uh, you've never seen a guy who could wrestle like this. Most vicious. He doesn't care anything about his own health, let alone that of his opponent. I heard. I've never seen him wrestle uh, personally, but from what I've read about him, what you've told me about him, he's definitely one of the top uh, he's top a stars crippler. in the business. He's a crippler. He doesn't believe in letting anyone walk out of the ring. Win or lose a match, you get carried out of the ring. Well, that's a pretty good philosophy to take if you want to be a winner in the in the business. That pr- that might have been the very first mention ever on the show of Cactus Jack. It was the second. The first one was Mark Tindler was putting over his new guys, and he said Cactus Cactus, Cactus, Jack, Cactus Foley. Jack Foley. Yeah. And then you hear his wife in the background saying, "He goes by Manson." <laughs> <laughs> Because that's right. So the second reference. Yes. Yeah, because, you know, sometimes you forget this was kind of the precursor. This was before the debut of uh, Cactus Jack, which happens in September of 89. Did Sonny introduce you to to Jack? Yes. Yeah. 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 I didn't know him. 
Yeah, and it sounds and like he was getting pretty close. Cool. And that day, that September day, that that historic day. In September, June, July, August of, of eighty nine. Yeah, so we still got about four months before his debut. June, July, What's August. Sonny's no, problem. Sonny, what do you mean? Is in there every day. <laughs> yeah, well, it Mick was working in Texas still. Oh, uh, yeah, he wasn't signed with W with NWA yet, right? No, that was pre NWA. He got signed yeah. by NWA right around the time that he made his debut and a little past the debut on pro wrestling spotlight. He was brought in. Yeah. yeah I hadn't I even seen pretty- the guy. I saw tape. I hadn't seen anything about him. I didn't know nothing about him really. Just whatever Sonny told you. This guy's great. Trust me. He's great. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, then meeting him, I still hadn't seen any of his matches. Mm-hmm. And then he invited me to, um, uh, come over and uh, and watch some of his matches from Texas, and I was like, "Holy shit, this fucking guy's great!" Wow. Like how fucking cool when you just think about it. The idea, can you just um, like just imagine in all of our little fan minds, just being like, "Hey, you want to go watch Cactus Jack matches with Cactus?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let's put that. Yeah, on. And then he showed me the Dude Love uh, yeah. movie he did. Yeah, it was quite a, it was quite the uh, groundbreaking, and and to this day, all these years later, thirty five years later, you know, spoke to him not too long ago. Yeah, we'll be seeing him. Uh, we'll be seeing him again probably in November, right here in Tennessee. Right here. Uh, and actually Sonny and him are still friends, you know, I, having talked yes. to Sonny recently about it too. I asked if he had, if he had talked to Mick recently and he goes, Oh yeah, yeah. Like they still talk. There's regularly. an endearment there that they have for each other. And it's a, it's a true yeah. deep appreciation and a friendship between those two. Yeah. They both, anytime I've talked to either one about the other and I have, I've been lucky enough to do that. I'd be like, Hey, you remember Sonny? They both have that same like, oh, like they light up about each other. When yeah. I told Mick, I was like, hey, Sonny Blaze sends his best. And he's all like, he just kind of sat back. He's like, you talk to Broadway? And I'm like, I do. Yeah. yeah. Like it was, uh, it's really cool to see that there, yes. you know, they're linked. Uh, and even then, uh, when I saw Foley at Caroline's on Broadway before it shut down, obviously, but, uh, Part of his one man show, part of his act was about Sonny. He mentioned Sonny. Like he's in the thing. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's at the time, cool. I didn't know who Sonny was. I just was all like, okay, he's talking about some dude. And then when I got to know you and hear these things, I'm like, oh shit, that's that guy. <laughs> yeah. That's Broadway. Yeah. Uh, let's see. The show starts to sort of un- unwinds on you a little bit. Kind of no, unravels. that's never happened before. I think your sickness is getting the better of you. I don't think mm-hmm. I heard it in one of the clips, but at one point you just stop the show because you have to get this cough drop out of your mouth that you think is messing <laughs> with you. <laughs> Almost everything too. For the Patreons who love the, the technical glitches as much as I do, <laughs> this one was riddled with them. Every time you nope, went into an interview, you can hear the countdown. There's one time you go from Donnie into an ad break and you can, it cuts back to Donnie telling us, like, Oh yeah, I'm going to see them on Wednesday. And then he goes into the ads. Like, <laughs> that was the beauty of the show back then. Yeah. We, but it's also the beauty of technology. Realistically. Yeah. I'm a nerd. You know what I mean? I've worked in it 30 years, you know, like, the idea of hearing all that stuff happen and you know it's because this switch has to go in this order, you got to do this kind of thing. Like, there was a blip. There, the timing wasn't just quite right. It was almost there. There's a delay. That's why we heard two seconds of this because they didn't know it until two seconds later. You know, like, um, it's just really cool. It's cool. And this one's riddled with it. But this I, one. I really like the fact that you have such an appreciation for this. 
I mean, it's cool. I remember looking up old, um, I think I even sent you a picture. I found an old, uh, like radio phone thing where it was like a phone that pulls off the hook, but moves onto a speaker. And it was like for an old radio studio. And every Mm -hmm. now and again, I find stuff like that, like different, um, antique shops. Some of the drawings I've used for here of radios and old things are actually things I have found in antique shops. And so like, this feels like an old John radio, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, this one, you're slipping and you refer to Al, Al. Hey, let me, let's go to Al. Let's see what he's got to say. And, I was, uh, I was, I was whacked out of my head. Yeah. I was so sick. So robotussed up. Um, but you didn't actually get Al. Um, something else happened instead. So let's see how this goes. Phones are lighting up once again, and what we're going to do is uh, is talk to Al for a minute. Al, how you doing? <laughs> we're just a little, the phone's just been, so many lines are lighting up at once. Uh, what we're trying to do is just uh, find out who is on the pro wrestling spotlight. Well, John, I just want to make a comment first before you speak with Al. Uh, <laughs> about, what was that guy's name? Billy from Lindenhurst, right? right? Guy, he had a very valid point. He did, and if he remembers, Tex McKenzie with the IWA show, and that guy Reynolds, I forget his Jack name. Reynolds. Jack Reynolds. They used to him. always tell, and I want to stress the point right now to any of the young men out there, or women listening, don't try it at home. I get paid very, very well to get in the ring and absorb that kind of punishment, and I charge them very well because it hurts. Mm-hmm. I agree. They shouldn't be trying. There was a... Uh, a case a few years ago where a youngster put a sleeper hold on his mother and the judge ordered that he could not watch wrestling I read anymore. I remember that case. I remember that. And they were actually uh, thinking, the New York State Legislature was actually thinking of outlawing in New York for that reason. It's not a, don't try it at home. Uh, I'm in a ring. I'm well trained. I work out. I'm in condition for it. You wouldn't try to box. Don't, you wouldn't try to play football without pads. Don't try to wrestle. I totally agree. Join the team at school. It's great exercise for you. Okay, we got the phones are lighting up again. 661-1440 is the number at the Pro Wrestling Spotlight. Hello, you're on the air. Who's this? Oh, uh, yeah, John. This is Vinny from Copeg. Hey, Vinny. How you doing? Okay. Guess uh, what? Excuse me? Guess what? What? You're calling number 200. Oh, great. Da, 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 da. <laughs> so an unexpected surprise for you. Yeah, it is. <laughs> There's a drum roll being held in the background. I think G-Man is putting it up. But anyway, Vinny, congratulations on that, first of all. Thanks a lot. Hey. You have a question? Yeah, I have a couple of quick questions. Uh, Dusty, is he going to have the same booking power in the WWF that he had in the NWA? Rumors are circulating that, uh, from what people say, Dusty's telling them that he's going to wrestle for a year and then start uh, going into the into the front office and uh, and, and start booking. Uh-huh. But I don't know how true that is or not. Uh-huh. And another thing is, uh, how come you don't see any more midget matches in the WWF? That's a surprise. You know, that really is surprising because uh, considering the way they they, uh, they run their shows, you know, obviously midgets would be a part of it, but that's right. I haven't seen midgets for a very long time. Yeah, I know because years ago you used to see them a lot. All the time. They used yeah. to always, like, open up the show at the Garden when I, was, when I used to go regularly. Yeah, yeah. And the last one is uh, George the Animal Steel. Uh, is there any possibility that, I know he had colon surgery. Yes, he did. Uh, is there any possibility that he'll be coming back as, uh, as a wrestler? Uh, as of right now, I don't know. I know he's working now uh, in the front office. Agent, yeah. He's, yeah, he's he's one of the road agents for the yeah. WWF. Okay, thanks a lot. All right, listen, hold on, okay, because okay. we need to get information from you as far as where to pick up these prizes. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Right, bye-bye. Vince De Palma was the guy's name. Mr. Palmer. Why do I remember that? He was a listener. And Why do I remember that? Maybe because he was the 200th caller, which was the total work anyway. <laughs> how do I determine how many call came in since April 9th, 89? And here we are in June. I had 200 callers. Those First are off, fucking work. I... If I'd known that on this episode you're going to say you're the 200th caller, I would have been counting. I might go back. If I find some time, I might go back and just listen for callers and do a tick mark. Because I could play back at triple speed or whatever because I just hear a caller. I can't imagine you were taking any kind of record of that. There was no way. (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, it's by the hand. You. you know, it's like theater of the mind. <laughs> it's also so good. Because on the other side, you're already working it where you're so like, his name is Vince Palma. Why do I remember that? Because he was my 200th caller. <laughs> That's how much it means to me. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> Can't wait yeah. till we start hearing from George from Lindenhurst. That ain't gonna be it's gonna be coming up not in the not too distant future. Like also, how dumb this is Vinny from whatever, and you're just all like, guess what? <laughs> <laughs> what? I don't even remember and if I was like, promoting what? that, but we're gonna get what? <laughs> Nothing about it came up before. There's no way I was promoting that. Like, did I preface it in the show saying, "Hey, today we're gonna get have have a prize for that 200th caller"? Never. At any point did you ever mention how many caller numbers you've ever had until this one? (laughs) No. (laughs) I think you mentioned your first caller. Hey, you're a first caller. Yeah, Nick from (laughs) Massapequa. Yeah, Nick from (laughs) Massapequa. And why do you remember it? Because he's your first caller. <laughs> yeah, I love theater it's... of the mind. Yeah, you have to have a good imagination. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hey, I'm talking about a worked business. <laughs> there was part of me though when I heard that I was like, there's no way, right? Bruce wasn't just keeping a tally back there because Bruce wasn't even ever yeah. first three. It was... But it is the kind of weird thing. I don't know Bruce super well, but I could see someone like Bruce doing having a notepad. That he's just marking on there and he goes, hey, just so you know, I've been counting this. He seems a kind of random thing he would bring up. You go, what you been doing, Bruce? I'll have to ask him on the next Wally Backman show. (laughs) Hey, were you counting those? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Really good. Uh, And man, Sonny is so great. So great. I love that. Because you said, let's talk to Al. And he goes, hey, before you get to Al, I have something I want to say. (laughs) (laughs) But then he references the caller from before. You had a caller (laughs) earlier. I didn't play it. Patrons will get it. Uh, Where a caller says, hey, none of these promotions are saying don't try this at home. And he was an ER nurse or responder or something. He He worked in ERs. He did. And he said... I've seen these kids come in because they think they can do these things. And I think that these, these promoters need to do a better job of saying that they're professionals and you shouldn't try this at home. And you took his side. You said, obviously they should, but I do think it's kind of interesting because I didn't realize that there was a period of time because obviously there would have been. So it's a dumb, not really. It's one of those like, aha, uh-huh, I'm done moments. Of course they didn't always, they wouldn't have. But when I started watching, they were saying that the beginning of everything, every yeah. war, raw is war. They'd have this little thing about, and they'd show people getting injured and said, these are professionals don't try it at home. Like it's kind of interesting. There was a guy talking about it here and then, and then Al wanted to, to pitch in. He just couldn't. Sonny had to instead. Yeah. Uh, do you remember that case that he talked about? Yes. What do you remember about that? Because I was like, what is happening? It had a lot of uh, publicity because it was wrestling and wrestling was so popular. And here's a kid who slaps a sleeper hold on his mother. And uh, oh, wow. so it got it got some coverage. He put a sleeper hold on her? Yeah. Look. I know you were the wrestling. Thing I, the only times. thing I ever did to my mom was I gave her a, a German suplex a couple of times. I was trying to demonstrate, you know, demonstrate, uh, you know, especially right before Cactus Jack showed up at the house the first time. She ran out into the parking lot screaming. You're like, I'm afraid of him. It's just I'm afraid of him. <laughs> There's no way you got your mom in a German suplex. No, of course not. <laughs> like, right. She would have killed when me. When I was in high school, a kid came up to me and he goes, hey, you watch a lot of wrestling? I was like, yeah. And this was at a church. And it was in Alaska and it was very snowy. And so there's big snow banks everywhere. He goes, do you think you could suplex me? And I was all like, absolutely. <laughs> hey, I, I walked I, over to the, the snow bank and I suplexed him. I told him where I was going to grab him. I told him I was going to 
I separated my shoulder once because I told my friend I was drunk off my ass in college in the dorm. And I was like, backdrop me. And of course, it's hard yeah. floor. And I was like, backdrop you. So I, 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 the guy bent over and I got a backdrop and I had to go to hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, back up here. Are you sure? Definitely sure. And I have eight, I have actually eight millimeter films of of me uh, beating the shit out of my little sister in the backyard, like wrestling style. I'd put her in a uh, in uh, what do you call those things? The swing? Uh, yeah, like uh, like the fireman carry where you would turn around. No, I'd pick her up by the legs and swing her around. Yeah, yeah, that's the swing. That's the the yeah, yeah. But there was another name for it back then. But yeah, I have uh, Cesaro had it. Me to film of that, and I, you know, and they were filming it, and I, you know, bent over and I split my pants. I never forget that. That's on eight millimeter film. Maybe I should put that up for Patriots. <laughs> <laughs> but I did a lot of that stuff in in school and college, and there was actually there was actually when I was at Graham Junior Giant College, swing? we. So I'm seeing Cesaro swing and giant swing, where it's where you grab him by the foot and you swing like around. Cesaro swing. It's like Cesaro. That's what it was. Like the Cesaro swing, whatever the, the terminology yeah. was. It was. To I think it was originally called the giant airplane swing. spin. Airplane spin. I think they called it back. Then. Oh, maybe. yep, yep, maybe. yep. No, airplane uh, was when they had you on, on your shoulders and you spun around and then you flipped it. Back in when I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> Not in my day, God. Not 1972, brother. <laughs> And then in college, uh, you know, because I had the Pro Wrestling Spotlight show and, and we actually did a, uh, a fake wrestling card in the studio of WINR, which was our college TV station. And um, we had about three matches and we had ketchup for blood. And and, and they had a big curtain that they called the, the psych. It was called the psych or something in the, in the studio. And somebody, uh, somebody fell against it and ripped it, which thousands of dollars in damage and the show never aired, but we taped it in college. So I used to do a lot of crazy fake pro wrestling shit in college too. I never did pro wrestling stuff. I did stunt stuff though. I thought I'd be a stunt man one yeah. day. Ooh, that's a hard life. I think they're very closely related. And if I'm honest, apart from like the real tragedies that happened in the stunt work, I think the day-to-day -day life and work of a professional wrestler is way rougher on the body, I think. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, but, you know, it's what it is. Uh, God, what else was in that that I was going to mention? Because it was so f good. Um, but, yeah, so Sonny Blaze comes on and says that he's going to talk to you there. Um, uh, uh, let's get to the last clip. This is... Sonny's still on the line, and this is kind of towards the end of the show. You're kind of winding down. Uh, and I feel like there's a follow-up in here that was really good. Let's find out. Did, did I do my job right? Let's see. No, we don't. You're just taking information from the winner. And Al hung up. So uh, that, was the, uh, that, that was the end of that. So let's see what we got here. Six six one forty forty. Once again, let me give you let me give you a hint on this on this contest question. Since we're running out of time here, how many times did Gorilla Monsoon hold the WWF Tag Team Title? More than once. How's that? And less than three times. But uh, <laughs> that's easy enough. But who were one of his tag team partners? And the other, all you have to do is mention this guy's. Oh my God, the G-Man's counting on his fingers. It's between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One. None of that there. But as far as you need to name one of his tag team partners, and let me give you another clue. This guy was on this Pro Wrestling Spotlight radio show. He was one of our guest stars last week. So let's see if uh, you guys got the answer out there. G-Man is stumped. No, it wasn't Marty Pereira, G-Man. It wasn't Marty. I warned you about that. Don't mention his name here. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot, a lot of fun. So, uh, Broadway here just does not want to hear that name anymore. John, I just want to make a comment. I want to pat you on the back for a second. Um, like Barry Horowitz? <laughs> like Barry Horowitz, who's not a bad wrestler, by the way. No. But uh, I really wish that growing up as a fan of professional wrestling, there had been a show like this available for me to listen to. Nowhere do you get... <clears throat>
to absorb the history of the sport. Like you give wrestling back its sense of history. You bring men like Bobo Brazil on, uh, Angelo Savoldi, uh, Bruno San Martino. Uh, you speak about past events of wrestling that just don't happen. I mean, the WWF had the greatest heavyweight champion of all time, Bruno San Martino, twice held the title. Never hear of There are people listening now. By the way, Bob Backlund was a six-year world's heavyweight champion. Mm -hmm. They never mention that. Mm -hmm. They never mention Billy Graham, except for when he was with the show. And then they only alluded to his holding the title. Ivan Koloff, Stan Stasiak, these were great athletes, and they deserve the credit you give them here on the Well, I appreciate show. that. And see that... You know, when I was growing up, there, there was not a wrestling radio show. Uh, now they're springing up. Uh, there's WFAN obviously has one, and I understand another station is going to start one as well on a Spanish station. Well, you blazed the trail. They owe it to hey, you. Hey, I had a wrestling radio show in 1976 That's in right. Boston for three years. So uh, that was a lot of fun doing that. And G-Man, you weren't even born. You were just in diapers back then. No, that's not true. I was No, I was so born. You were having the playpen play. Was Excuse happening. me. I was one of your greatest fans. Hey, I appreciate it. Oh, when I was working... Uh, for all two of your matches. Yes, beautiful, beautiful. You're a hell of a guy. Now, shut your microphone off so I can take this call. I appreciate your comments, G-Man. You are a heck of a guy. Wow, I was out of control. I was all I think medicated. I'm the current number one... John Anthony wrestling fan though, because I made really? the eight by tens. Yeah, you I did. made eight by tens. I was gonna have because when when I thought that you, me, and Sonny would all be in CAC, yeah, I went to like print those eight by tens of Sonny that I had drawn up, ones of you that I had drawn up, and I was like gonna throw in a few of me. So if any goofy person was like, "Oh, that's pro wrestling spotlight," we could just have a goof and be like, "Here's." Here's well, we can plan a trip little. down to Florida so we had to hang out with Sonny and get these things signed and <laughs> might as well. Did, you know, what the heck? I'm open I'm for anything. The biggest the me. biggest disappointment from the CAC this year, not because it wasn't good because it was fantastic, was just the people you didn't get to see. And that's just the that's just the fact yeah. of the matter every year. The biggest disappointment is the ones you lose, the ones who didn't make it, and it's just a bummer because you just so badly want to see everybody. You and know? you had you had uh, been planning that trip for a long time, and everything yeah. had fallen in place until it w wasn't. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it unraveled quickly, but at the same time, yeah, oh, I'd happily go out to Florida. So you wound up hanging out with Carmine Despierto. I did. I hung out with Carmine Despierto for a whole you evening. It was funny. UB yeah. Marks. UB Marks? That was his other name. This is ring name. Is, is that what he uh managed uh, under? He did tell what he did what? He was a manager under that name, UB Marks. That UB Marks was his manager name? Because yeah, he managed Sonny, is what he told me. Yeah. You you're but, good with the Google and stuff. UB Marks, M A R X X. U B <laughs> H H U B I E. God. It sounds terrible. <laughs> Two X's. Yeah. How did he spell UB? I think it's H U B I E. Nothing. UB Marks. UB Marks. Herbert. EJ. I don't know. I'll find. I I have him on Facebook. I'll just go straight to the source. Hey, and give us a report some, on the next episode. Some <clears throat> yeah, send me some shots. He's an editor of Wrestling Eye magazine. Yeah. He's a really interesting guy. Dude, his oh, stories too. That was the last night I was there, and it was like probably the drunkest I was. Well, that's because you were and, with UB Marks. <laughs> yeah. And it was the most fascinating night because that night I hung out with Taku for like two hours. I hung out with yeah. Sabu for like an hour. I told you about that. <laughs> and then I hung out with Carmine for like three hours. And this was all after I'd like been hanging out with Kurt Henning's son. Like it was just a wild night where at the end of it all, it's like, okay, this is a crescendo. Like this is crazy. Yeah. So um, it wasn't as bad as you, it wasn't as bad as you portrayed it. Even though it's no, because at the end of the day, enough. I still got Sonny Blaze stories. Cause I asked people, I would walk up to him. I was like, you remember Broadway Sonny Blaze? <laughs> They said yes, and I asked them everything they knew about him. You know, it was good. It was a good time. And this was a good show. Yeah, it was a lot of. Did uh, you notice? 
the beginning of this clip, you say, I think I cut out the last line because you're like, is there any more callers? And you're like, no, and you're like, no one's on the line. You say, Al hung up. <laughs> that was you <laughs> trying to cover for saying we're going to talk to Al. Yeah. Yeah. So Don't Al's know. not on the line. Hey, we- not on- Damn, nah, I really want. Uh, we really wanted to say hello to Al. <laughs> that yeah. and then well, at the very end the too, book. you said uh, when they mentioned Broadway or when they mentioned Marty, like don't mention his name, Al. Broadway here has an issue. <laughs> <laughs> it was hard That's crossing okay. that line, you know, because you become friends with a dude and you hang out and you know, and you keep forgetting his ring name. I've always found that fascinating from a very yeah. realistic standpoint. Uh, the amount of people who refer to people by certain names. I mean, the fact that Foley was Jack to everyone, even when he was Mankind or Mick or whatever he was supposed to be. And Cornette's talked about how they always used their in-ring names because they didn't want to mess up. Yeah. You didn't want to go out there live and in the heat of the moment and call them by something else. And to be honest, it happened on Raw like this past week. I forget who it was. Oh, uh, I remember it was Drew talking about Wade. and Or no, it was Kaiser talking about Wade. He accidentally called him Stu. And he's Wade wow. in WWF. Wow. But he called and him it's, Stu. And you know, that's, that's a good point because even with uh, Mick, I, you know, he when he reaches out to me or you know, when I reach out to him, I, I call him Cactus. And when he sends mm-hmm. me an email or a text, hey, it's Cactus. And that's yeah. how I referred to him when I first met him. It was Cactus. Yeah. It's interesting. I've always preferred it. Even when I was doing the indie ref stuff, there's a good buddy of mine, Iron Manzi. I don't think he's still going at it. And I hope he comes back because he was a really good dude. But it took me like two years to find out his name was Zach. <laughs> well, like, good. Wow. I'd rather call him Iron Manzi because I don't want to be in a position where I'm all like screaming out the wrong guy's name. Right. Yeah. Uh so I've always found that interesting. I even had people they introduce me by their real names, and I was be a name, especially if I was in my stripes. It was like, no, 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 I need to know your name. I don't want to say the wrong name. Well, so there's a half a dozen find- people, half a dozen people that I went to college with that were closest brothers, and they still call me by my college nickname and not by my name, which was not, for the record, Big Pork Barbecue. Anyone questioning no. or wondering that is no, not it? That's, that's power. But the answer is in the book. The answer is in the book on that college nickname, which I'm not going to repeat. (laughs) I don't want you to. I definitely don't want you to. (laughs) Please don't. In the book. It is in the book. So anybody who hasn't already, (laughs) get it on Amazon. The audio book's my favorite. Uh, But uh, yeah, this was a cool one. This was great. And yeah, it it was funny to hear, hear you slipping with the owl, especially because we heard it from the beginning. You called him Al three weeks in a row. And then for like three more weeks, you're like, hey, we got Broadway in here. So, yep. um, yeah, this this was a good one to go over and reminisce all the craziness of that uh, time period 35 years ago on Pro Wrestling Spotlight, especially with caller number 200. Caller number 200. This is a marquee show. I'm just going to so. say, though, for any random or, or not random. That's totally incorrect. For any uh, uh, general listener and viewer of you, you guys would all have noticed by now. I did way more clips this week than I usually do. I try to keep it around like six or seven. This was 10. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a lot I didn't pick up because it was just a lot of fun stuff happening. So this is one of those ones where it's all like, there's some episodes where I pick out enough stuff from me like the rest of it's static. This isn't one of those ones. This one is such a fun listen because of all this stupid (laughs) stuff happening. You're breaking down coughing and ruining your own show because you just can't keep... (laughs) Well, I would advise... It's up there on uh, Patreon, and even in the the description, I should really have you write the show notes now on there. Because that uh, it is up on Patreon, so we'll have more fun. I mean, it's even like, wait till we get to like me and Al talking about starting our own wrestling promotion called ECW well before ECW was even a thing. Do you remember what the E was going to be? Yeah. East side championship race or Eastern. It was, I think it was Eastern. It was the same name that Todd Gordon. 
Yeah. Yeah. Do you think Todd took it from you? Who knows? Because you talked to Todd. I'm not saying in a bad way, but in a way of, hey, they're not using it, and it's a good name, right? Like, Maybe. You I, I doubt it. It's probably just coincidence. I didn't even know Todd Gordon back then. Okay. That's what I was really getting to. Did you know him enough where you would have talked about it, and he would say eventually? No, no. Because you know. this was like 89. We started talking about ECW after we yeah. met uh, Lindy Motors because he was interested yeah. in getting in. All right. Yeah, lots of yeah, good stuff. Good to come. This first year is yeah. incredible in regard to how simple it was and how crazy it was and and all these little nuances that we, we get to review each week. Yeah. Uh, Bruce becomes a lot more predominant in this episode as well. So, uh, And this one here? Hasn't yet, we got to try just, to bring him on. We'll have to get Maybe. him for one of these. This... <laughs> Between your travel and my shenanigans, this was an, uh, hey, we better I know sit down and we'll record this on. now. <laughs> I know when we'll bring him on, when we no. get his mother to be a caller going against oh, Paul E. That would actually be a great I, story. I've, I have wondered about that. That would be a Bruce Jacobs story uh, to bring him on to talk about that, because that was a beloved moment, because his mom passed, obviously, and and that was one of the most historic and funniest bits in the history of the pro wrestling spotlight. And Paul E knew nothing that it was a work. He thought it was a total shoot. He had no idea that that woman who was calling in was not Jim from Lindenhurst's mother. That's crazy. And I'd want to know, I mean, obviously we'll get there, but I, I'm going to want to know, did he talk to his mom before or after? Did he warn her? Did she know? What did she right. not know? What did she get mad about later? Did she say, yeah. you didn't tell me it would be like that? Or did she just say, how fun? Like, I want to know the before and afters. L.A. Law. <laughs> L.A. Law. <laughs> what do you watch? I watch L.A. Law. Oh, L.A. Law. Oh. <laughs> that could be good. We got a lot of good stuff to come. That's why I'm glad we're doing this. Get yeah. those people uh, like fired up. Maybe we'll get some more patrons because we have a countdown. If we don't get enough patrons, that's it. Nothing. We're done. Just be you and me recording, but never releasing. Never meet up for months. Yeah. Just (laughs) the JD Salinger archive. Oh, there's a show out there. There All is. right, John. Let's wrap it oh, up. Let's, let's get out of here. You got the Mets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Mets uh, gotta... pregame show for the Mets goes on in four minutes, so I got to get the hell out of here. I got to turn on that TV. Yeah, you got to get out of here pretty quick. So uh, get to it. All right. Thank you so much, March and uh, Mar- March. <laughs> Back in 1989, can't pronounce nothing. Uh, anyway, that's good. Is going to wrap up this edition of the Pro Wrestling Spotlight Rewind, and I want to thank uh, Marsh as I do each and every week. He is our producer, our creative director, co-host of these uh, r- rewinds, and you could reach him on Instagram and on X. On X, it's at Ref Marsh, and at Instagram, it's at Wrestling on the Rocks. Follow me on X at John Arizzi. Instagram at John Arizzi threads at John Arezzi as well. We talk about it every week. Public page, private page under John Arezzi's Matt Memories on Facebook. Pro Wrestling Spotlight group is there. Our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Pro Wrestling Spotlight. And most importantly, patreon.com forward slash John Arezzi. This is the only way to hear this show if you're a patron. So go to patreon.com and spread the word. Tell your friends about it. And I want to thank our Patreon executive producers. And we're going to bring on Anthony Pyrus and Joe Holloway. Uh, we're going to get them on here pretty soon. But uh, those guys are the benchmarks. Uh, and we appreciate their support all this time with this program. Anthony and Joe, thank you again. And thank you to each and every one of you patrons for your support, helping keep this show going. Until next time, when we relive more history with you, this is John Arezzi for Pro Wrestling Spotlight. Rewind. Well, fans, that's all the time we have this week. I'm John Arezzi. See you next time, everybody.